I first heard of this this story of Pat, the truth about Pat Tillman and his death, because when he first died, um, it, he, it was the story that was told by the government and picked up everywhere was that he died uh, <clears throat> at the hands of the enemy, that he picked up his weapon and killed like nine enemy soldiers before he was shot and killed, et cetera. And it was a very heroic, uh, heroic moment. And that's what was spread around the country. Then <clears throat> I was a Pulitzer Prize judge and I was uh, judging the national category. And I, and I saw this uh, two-part or three-part series in the Washington Post by Stephen Call, a reporter, and he told the truth about what happened to Pat Tillman, and I was shocked. And you're, we're supposed to read these things really fast and pass them on, you know, because there's so many entries. I could not. I was just riveted to this these three this three part series. And you know, in those days, that was a long time ago. Uh, there was no internet, so I, I didn't know. I didn't know the Washington Post had this story, and it wasn't really picked up. In any case, uh, a few years go by, and it's Memorial Day. And um, uh, Mary and her family had just gotten, uh, uh, or, or were pressing for the truth of what happened to Pat. And my husband, Robert Shear, was a columnist at the LA Times, and he wrote a column about this, about, he made this his Memorial Day column, is how did this patriotic, heroic character, Pat Tillman, how did, how was his death? perverted into being, you know, this heroic death at the, at the hands of the enemy when it was actually friendly fire. And the phone rang and uh, the operator said, um, Pat Tillman's mother, Mary Tillman's on the phone. And Bob was almost afraid to pick it up. He thought she was going to ream him out for, <laughs> right. for writing the truth and uh, writing about this, you know. And instead, she was like, a bulldog on this. She said, I have, if you want to come to my house, I have hundreds of pages of documents, reports, et cetera, et cetera. You can see what happened. You could read what happened. You could write about it. And he said, can I bring my wife? At that time, I was the deputy editor of the Chronicle. And I, I ended up assigning a reporter to write about it. And we went to, to Mary's house and spent several hours there, several hours going through all this, I was blown away. I mean, as a journalist, when you're told one story and it's on the national stage, and then you look at the documents that were withheld from you and the family, from everyone, especially the family, uh, and then you meet these people. I mean, Mary was, a, like I said, a bulldog on this. She was not going to let this happen and, and just go by and ha and and I'll have her tell more about how what they did to the family in terms of his memorial and everything. But uh, that's how I that's how we met. And then we decided to do a book on, on the story. But Danny, why don't you talk about what how they treated you and the memorial? And well, I think initially, too, it should be, you know, my youngest son, from the very beginning, even when we heard the original story, he couldn't wrap his head around it. He kept saying, you know, this sounds too much like a John Wayne movie. Um, how Is would that Rit Richard? Pat, Pat, yes. Yeah. And how would Pat make himself that vulnerable, you know, to the enemy? I mean, it didn't add up. And he was, you know, adamant about that and very upset about it. And of course, this was even before the friendly fire was, um, you know, exposed. And then a month later, we were we were then told that it was a friendly fire incident, and we got the documents. Um, things just weren't adding up, and so I actually did kind of, you know, at the time I didn't want anyone to know that I had gone to the Washington Post, but I actually did take some of the documents to Steve Cole, who was then the editor um, of the Washington Post. And he was interested in, in, you know, looking into the story and, and he had a reporter and I 
I think his name was Josh White. He did a lot of research on it. And, and, you know, so that, you know, they did their best. And then of course, you know, other things were written. And then, you know, of course I did meet Narda and Bob and they were, you know, very struck by the, the documents and the inconsistencies and what seemed like blatant lies. And mm -hmm. we wanted to try to get in some kind of, you know, hearing, uh, congressional hearing something. And we, we, we wrote the book in an effort to do that. As it turned out, the, the congressional hearing came about before the book was even finished. And so we did get the hearings. We got two of them. Um, and they did come to the conclusion that there was a cover up in Pat's death, but they never followed through to find out who instigated it and who is at the top, you know, who started the whole mm -hmm. process. And I think um, for me at, at that congressional hearing, the most shocking thing was, and Mary can address this too, was there were these four the generals and I think Rumsfeld was there. Was that right, Mary? I mean, yes, yeah, Rumsfeld, yeah. Abizade. Yeah. I think yeah. um, I want to say General Brownlee. Um, I think so. And yeah, one I other don't one. remember all of yeah. them. But they all basically lied 82 times. Mm -hmm. they, they said they didn't remember. I don't recall 82 times. Yeah. yeah. They said, uh, where were you when you learned that Pat Tillman had been killed? And they all said, I don't remember. And, and I was telling Mary, I remember I was driving in my car with my husband. I heard it on the radio and I, I almost started to cry. It was like, I knew where I was. And you're not in the military. It. And Rumsfeld doesn't know where he was when he heard Pat Tillman was killed. The lies were so blatant and it was so insulting to this family. You know, they just wanted the truth and they, and, and the, 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 the story was made up like almost on the spot. You know, it was like they, he, he got out of his vehicle. He came under attack. His platoon came under attack. He started firing. He killed nine people. And then we found out doing research that there was the same exact story about Pat's hero, heroism there, there was told earlier by the same AP reporter who wrote it um, about another person who came under fire and shot nine enemy dead. I mean, it was almost the same language. And I, I actually got a hold of the reporter. I have a friend who was a, a reporter at AP and I said, can you get me in touch with this guy? And he was somewhere in the Middle East. I think he was in Afghanistan. And I got him on the phone and I said, these stories you wrote under your byline are almost exactly identical. And one of them is totally not true. So how'd that happen? And he, he couldn't remember. And then he said, oh, I think I got the information from the military. I don't know. But it was all set up. So he was just acting as a stenographer? I guess. I mean, I don't know. You know, some reporters get, I don't want to disparage my colleague, my former colleagues, but um, some of them, they want to have a close relationship right. to the people they're covered so they could get, you know, breaks on stories and stuff. So maybe they, that he just swallowed what they told him and he didn't, what I, he didn't remember that he had written the same story a few months earlier. I don't know. But, but I, I wanted to say that what's really important here is the time frame, which is Pat was killed on the 22nd of April. On the 22nd of April, there was a story in the, in the news that the United States had the highest number of soldiers who were killed in that war up until for, for the month of April than any other month since the war began. And Abu Ghraib was about to break. They knew that, you know, Cy Hirsch's story was coming out. And so it was a very bad time for the military. They had to turn this into a, a an inspiring story. I think your your son, so Mary, your son Kevin, right, who was also served with Pat and was there, um, he test he said uh, it, it, during this hearing, I believe it was, he said that he called Pat's death a terrible tragedy, which was transformed into an inspirational message that served instead to support the nation's foreign policy wars. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, a lot of young men and women enlisted um, after Pat was killed. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've been contacted by by parents who actually lost their children and they enlisted because of Pat. Mm -hmm. And they didn't call to be um, hurtful. They, you know, they were proud of their children's service, but, you know, they did let me know this and it, you know, that would have been very upsetting to him Mm -hmm. to think that, you know, his death was used and somehow, you know, glorified or whatever in order to, you know, to, to get other people to enlist, um, in the military. Um, so I, I think it served their purpose 